Coming up this morning on Washington Journal, Olivia Golden of the Center for Law and Social Policy. She'll talk about states tightening rules for food stamps and welfare recipients. Also, Convention of States Project co-founder Michael Ferris on grassroots efforts to amend the Constitution through a method known as Article 5. And Kevin McCormley of Kiplinger offers advice to people preparing their 2014 federal taxes ahead of Wednesday's deadline. Good morning. It's Saturday, April 11th, 2015. The National Cherry Blossom Festival is taking place in Washington, D.C. today. And we have a three-hour Washington Journal ahead for you this morning. We'll be discussing state efforts to put restrictions on social welfare programs, a grassroots effort to call a new convention of states to amend the Constitution, and take your tax questions ahead of Wednesday's April 15th deadline. And up next, we'll be joined by Michael Ferris. He's co-founder of the group, the Convention for States Project. We'll discuss the grassroots effort to call an Article 5 convention to propose amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Washington Journal continues. For the next 45 minutes, we'll talk about Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution and the growing movement to hold an amendment convention. Michael Ferris is co-founder of the Convention of States Project. And Mr. Ferris, uh, first, Explain what Article 5 allows for in the Constitution and why the framers uh, originally included it. Sure. There are two ways you can amend the Constitution, two ways to propose amendments, two ways to ratify amendments. Uh, the Congress, by two-thirds of both House, can propose an amendment, and that's the way it's, uh, all the amendments that we've adopted have been done. And then the states can also propose amendments by uh, calling for a convention. When 34 states, that's two-thirds of the states, apply for a convention for the same purpose, then you have a convention uh, limited to that purpose. So if there's 24 states, excuse me, 34 states that call for a convention for uh, changing the, the election of the U.S. Senators, which is one of the ones that was done in the past. Uh, then that would be the topic. We're calling for a convention to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and impose term limits on federal officials. So basically, reduce the power of Washington, D.C. is a shorthand way of saying the convention. And, uh, and who is we? Who is the Convention uh, of States Project? Uh, the Convention of States Project is a grassroots organization that uh, um, there are tens of thousands of volunteers now. Mark Meckler is the president of the organization. Uh, I'm the uh, chairman of the project itself, the Convention of States Project, and the Citizens for Self-Governance is the uh, sponsoring uh, nonprofit corporation that that's, uh, um, pays the staff and so on. Uh, but uh, we've got um, directors in virtually all 50 states, volunteer uh, state directors, volunteer legislative liaisons, and so on. So it's a, it's a big grassroots organization. And you mentioned a little bit uh, about what you'd like to see addressed uh, at a convention of the states. Right. Is there specific language uh, that you're looking to be uh, included in whatever amendment that's proposed? No, uh, we, we think that that's premature. That it, it, it's not my place or the place of any organization to draft the actual amendments. It's the place of the convention because the states need to come together and create language that is not only agreed to at the at the convention level but ha has the possibility of being ratified because the second two st and third steps are at the convention you vote one state one vote uh, so you have to have a simple majority of the states agree on the particular language of a, let's say a balanced budget amendment or an amendment limiting uh, the, the scope of the general welfare clause the uh, then that language will go back to the states for ratification and 38 states must eventually ratify so we're, we're not at the stage where we have to uh, debate the precise language right now we're saying should we have a conversation about imposing fiscal restraints and restraining the power of washington dc and, and do that in a way where you can come up with formal language when the formal language is drafted then the states take the final step of looking at the language and saying we like this or we don't and uh, ratifying or not we're talking about article five of the constitution the effort to call a convention of states we're going to talk through uh, how it would work but if you have questions for michael ferris our phone lines are open republicans 202-748-8001 democrats 202-748-8000 independents 202 748 
800-800-8002. And as you look to, to do this effort, is there any, uh, anything to look back on on history? Has this been done before? It's been attempted many times, but it's never been done. There have been 4, 000, excuse me, 400 applications uh, in round numbers for our convention of states, starting with Virginia. Virginia passed the first one in uh, 1788 that was filed in Congress in May of 1789, which basically called for the adoption of the Bill of Rights. But uh, we've never gotten to two-thirds of the states on any particular topic. And one of the biggest concerns about those who oppose the calling of a right. convention of the states is uh, what's termed a runaway convention, this idea that uh, at a convention of the states, they could propose any rule, throwing out the Constitution and starting over again. Here's a couple of uh, quotes that were gathered by uh, several groups that opposed this effort. Uh, these groups include uh, Democracy 21, uh, uh, People for the American Way, Public Citizen, USA Action, a few of these groups coming together to oppose it. They quoted a former Supreme Court Justice Warren Burger saying there's no way to effectively limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. The convention could make its own rules, set its own agenda, essentially put anything on the table. And then former Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg is also quoted in their release. Uh, there's no enforceable mechanism to prevent a convention from reporting out wholesale changes to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Warren Berger's comment was in a letter to Phyllis Schlafly, the longtime president of Eagle Forum, uh, which is similar to his article in Parade Magazine where he said the Second Amendment is an anachronism and shouldn't be, it should be ignored. Uh, th that's not legal scholarship. That's just him talking off the cuff. And uh, Supreme Court justices can be wrong about many things. That's why, you know, just they're sometimes the dissenting judges. So we, we don't know uh, that from legal scholarship. Legal scholarship says otherwise. In fact, most of the reason that most people think that a convention can be run away is we've not learned our history correctly about the original Constitution. People think that the original Constitution was supposed to only, the convention was only supposed to deal with amending the Articles of Confederation. But that's not true. That's not exactly what happened. The, the resolution that said only amend the Articles came from an advisory resolution by Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Congress under the Articles of Confederation had no power to call the convention. It had no implied powers under the Articles of Confederation. It was like a National Pickle Week resolution. It was just simply Congress endorsing the project that was already underway. Seven states had already called the convention, and what they told their delegates to do was to, and I'm quoting, re render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the Union. They were not told, only amend the Articles of Confederation. And in Federalist 40, Madison makes it clear that people misunderstood the source of their authority. It didn't come from this congressional resolution. It came from the states. And they followed their state's instructions. So virtually all the hysteria about the runaway convention comes from that false view of history. And it's really remarkable to me that they take the minority anti-federalist view of this question, whereas on vir virtually everything else, they take the federalist majority view, the James Madison view of these things. But we ignore that in this particular issue. We want to hear from our viewers. What do you think about the idea of an Article 5 convention of the states? What issues, if one were called, would you like to see addressed? Our phones are open if you want to talk to Michael Ferris about it, of the Convention of States Project. Republicans, it's 202-748-8001. And independents, 202-748-8002. We'll start uh, with Nasir in Arlington, Virginia. Line for Democrats. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, um, John. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Paris. That, uh, that there are 26 amendments in the U.S. Constitution. One of the amendments said that you are not guilty until proven to be guilty by court of law. So how come that in Guantanamo Bay all these years they're holding all those detainees without any trial? I'd like to know... Uh, what is this the scenario of this particular matter? A larger constitutional question for you. Uh, do you want to take it, or we can well, stick to I, I, constitutional I, I, conventions? I, I, I know I you're can, a scholar of these yeah, issues. I, I can. The uh, the due process clause applies to anyone who's under United States jurisdiction. Uh, but it, it, the the old saying is uh, the, there's a variety of what processes do. 
And so the people that are being held in Guantanamo Bay, are the, the legal theory is, is that they're unlawful combatants and the, the legal rules for unlawful combatants is different than people who are charged with ordinary crimes. And so, but that's, nobody's talking about changing any of those rules relative to the Convention of the States Project. It's an interesting background question, but in fact, my, my moot court teams have won a national championship on that question, but uh, uh, I don't think it's really what we're talking about today. You should note that Michael Ferris is co-founder of the Convention of States Project, also Chancellor of uh, Patrick Henry College, and he has served as lead counsel in the United States Supreme Court uh, for several uh, cases and served in federal and circuit courts as well to argue cases. Uh, he's with us for about the next half hour or so here on the Washington Journal. We're talking about an Article 5 Convention of the States. Larry, what would you like to see addressed at such a convention if it comes up? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see this come about. I feel this is nothing more than a bunch of smoke and mirrors. I think it's time that we go back to we, the people. We vote for such programs as The Voice and the contenders on The Voice. It's time that we, the people, do the voting. These legislators that we supposedly put in office because they wave Bibles and one thing or another are not getting the job done. We need those just solely do bills per week. We need a limit on this here no, doing nothing. We need to make them put bills in place, then we vote on those bills. Well, Michael Ferris, one of your arguments for calling a convention is to limit the power of the federal government. It is. In fact, the frustration this caller uh, is experiencing and expressing is that uh, it lies behind a lot of what we're doing is, is we believe that Washington, D.C. is trying to do too many things that it should, the Constitution gave Congress the authority to do several things, but those things were basically a theory of exclusive jurisdiction. National defense, uh, foreign policy, those things were exclusively for the federal government, and they were supposed to leave everything, much of everything else, to the states. And because Washington, D.C. is trying to be all things to all people, we have a huge mess, a financial mess, as well as a jurisdictional mess on our hands, and the liberty of people will, uh, is, is suffering. And we don't believe that Washington, D.C. will ever voluntarily limit its power. And George Mason is the one that's responsible at the Constitutional Convention for giving us this particular state-based approach. They said, he said, someday Washington, D.C. is going to abuse its authority, and no government should be the judge of the extent of its own power. So. Uh, we think that uh, it's time for the states to limit the power of the federal government and get back to we the people because that's, uh, there's much more responsiveness at the state level than there is at the federal level. Many of our viewers like to see the actual language uh, from the Constitution as much as we can. So here is uh, the relevant language from Article 5. The, the Congress on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for pro proposing amendments which shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths thereof. How many states have petitioned for a convention of the states? Uh, on our particular application, we, we're just over a year old. Uh, three states have completed the process of Florida, Georgia, and Alaska. Uh, we're midstream in, in, in uh, the midst of legislative uh, season now. Uh, six states have passed in one house our application this year. Uh, there's also a, a, an effort going on for just a balanced budget amendment that has a little over 20 states that have, have uh, applied for a convention of the states for that particular purpose. We think Do all the, con uh, the petitions have to apply for the same purpose for a convention to be called? True. There's, there's another one that's working uh, trying to repeal uh, Citizens United. And so there's a handful of states that have, have done that. You have to have two-thirds agree of the states agree on the particular subject matter. So the Citizens United applications don't go with ours. Ours don't go with the balanced budget. Uh, we think a balanced budget is a, is a good idea, but only when accompanied by tax limitations and spending limitations, which is why we say fiscal restraints rather, rather than just a balanced budget. Let's go to Otis, Houston, Texas, line for Republicans. Otis, good morning. You're on with Michael Ferris of the Convention of States Project. Good morning, Mike, and uh, glad to be here this morning and talking with you guys. So my beef is this. We have a president and uh, uh, a Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, sitting back 
and uh, in, uh, applying these kids from South America and and and, and overcrowding our schools and and, and burdening our uh, healthcare system as well as social service, and uh, that seem to be you know don't, they don't pay them. Obama kids don't go to a public school. See, so he don't care. But the rest of the American kids that that being open classroom are being overcrowded, and and they don't speak no English. I mean, I think it's a disgrace. How in the world can uh, a president get away? I mean, just abuse the immigration system like he's doing. Otis, with some concerns about illegal immigration, is that a topic that would be addressed through some of your efforts for a convention of the states? Uh, not directly, uh, although. The ability of the president to um, pass laws by himself through with his phone and his pen would be affected because uh, Article One, Section One of the Constitution says all legislative authority is vested in Congress, meaning only Congress can make laws. And so uh, there's effectively developed two constitutions in this country. We have the Constitution as written and then the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court and practiced by the federal government. In, in general terms, what we're trying to do is to go back to the Constitution as written by reversing the practice and precedent, both of the Supreme Court and the practice of, of the White House and Congress. So on this immigration issue, when President Obama decided to unilaterally change the law on this subject, that would not be permitted if we're, if we're successful in this, that he, he'd have to go to Congress to change the law. The other thing is that uh, if Congress was only dealing with the, the areas where Constitution gives them explicit authority and try, not trying to be all things to all people, they could focus on immigration and deal with it more effectively. But when they're trying to do so many things, they're so distracted. We haven't had a good immigration policy because of Congress's furiously trying to deal with every issue under the sun. Let's go to your home state of Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia. Joe's calling in line for Democrats. Joe, good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. The Constitution, as founded by our forefathers, was probably one of the most perfect <clears throat> documents that we'll ever know, and it must be preserved. But just like our forefathers said, it's so like a car. You need to tweak it. And they, uh, Jefferson and Patrick Henry said either every 70 or 140 years it need to be tweaked. But I'm using today's language of tweaked. And so we what about the issue of repealing the 17th Amendment? We, I just heard about the balanced budget. And then as well, we need to curb the uh, executive's uh, power as far as executive orders, because that's come just rampant. As well, the Supreme Court, our forefathers also said that the Supreme Court at one time, they, they projected that the Supreme Court and the court system would eventually run rampant of the American people. Well, uh, there's several issues there. The, um, uh, he's, he's right. The founders did think that, that we would need to amend the Constitution from time to time. Uh, and, and you're exactly right about that, uh, Joe. The, uh, um, and and they, one of the amendment process in place, in lieu of people feeling so frustrated, they started thinking about revolution. Uh, because the ability to lawfully change your government is, is a really important right of the people. Now, uh, we do need better checks and balances on the judiciary, for example. The Supreme Court itself has said 30 times, the only realistic check on our power is our own internal sense of self-restraint, which violates a very fundamental idea of our founders, and that is no branch of government should be the final judge of the extent of its own power. And so uh, having better checks on the judiciary is an issue. Uh, repealing the 17th Amendment would be germane under our application, whether or not a majority of states would want to vote for that at the convention, and whether or not 38 states would ratify that, I, I can't predict. But it is, uh, it would be germane to talk about that. Are you worried about unintended consequences uh, if a convention of the states is called? Tony writes, uh, I fear that opening up the Constitution may have unintended consequences with what he says, the mental midgets we have in government today. Well, first of all, we're, we're not opening it up for any and all purposes. We're opening it up for proposals on the topics of imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and imposing term limits on federal officials. Broad uh, areas. Broad areas, but, I, but it's opening it up to something that can get 38 states to ratify. It, uh, some wild proposal is not going to get through 38 states. There are right now 
uh, of our 99 state legislative chambers, Nebraska has a unicameral, 69 of those are controlled by Republicans and, and the balance are controlled by Democrats. Uh, the idea that we can get something crazy either for the right or the left through that maze is just simply not tenable. Uh, we have to take leave of our political senses to think that we would do something crazy. And we have much better government at the state level. We ask ourselves this question, who's a better judge of how much power Washington, D.C. should have? Washington, D.C. or the state legislature? Well, it brings up the question of who gets to go to this convention right. then if one is called? The state can members of Congress go? Oh, well, that would be up to the state legislatures. I doubt that they will appoint any members of Congress. Uh, first of all, they, they are going to have to serve at the convention for several months, and so that would be inconsistent with, with serving in Congress at the same time. But this, the short answer is the state legislatures appoint whoever they feel are the appropriate delegates. Ralph's up next. Washington, D.C., line for Republicans. Ralph, good morning. Uh, good morning. A couple of uh, points. Uh, one, uh, 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 a previous caller from Virginia said that the Constitution was a very uh, uh, you know, primary document that uh, was fundamentally good. I would disagree. I think the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, made a great uh, effort in fixing the flaws that were given, and uh, they are the amendments that we should uh, focus on in terms of fixing the inherent problems. Number two, with regard to your convention, Unless you deal with the Supreme Court and limit its ability on judicial review, there's several approaches on amendments. Uh, Tempting of America by Robert Bork outlined a few. Um, Mark Levin has outlined several approaches. But unless you limit the Supreme Court judicial review, you will end up with a fair victory because I'll just set aside anything that they dislike in terms of uh, your outcome. Well, uh, Mark Levin uh, has written a book on this called The Liberty Amendments, and he's specifically endorsed our project and is on our legal board of reference. Uh, and indeed, uh, having some checks and balances on the judiciary we think is essential. Uh, one idea, you know, Levin has proposed some ideas of, of giving the states the ability to, to override a decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, and to give Congress that power independently. Uh, there's been discussions of having the states be the ones who appoint the Supreme Court justices, much like the, uh, Court of Inter uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Every nation uh, nominates one justice uh, to that particular court. Uh, you could have a similar system here, but something has to be done to have better checks and balances on the judiciary. You're talking about endorsements, or you just did talk about right. endorsements. One right. uh, name that our viewers would know, Tom Coburn, right. uh, former senator from Oklahoma, has signed on to your efforts specifically. Right. Right. Uh, wrote a column earlier this year in the Washington Times, a means to smite the federal leviathan uh, is the headline of that piece. The founders foresaw the need to reinstitute limited government is what he writes. If our viewers want to read that, they can find it at the Washington Times. Richard's up next, Lake Placid, Florida. Line for Independence. Richard, good morning. Yes, good morning. Congress has been trying to destroy the Constitution uh, almost ever since they've been formed. Uh, the, the Founding Fathers said that uh, if we turn to a central banking system to uh, monitor our economics and the monetary system, then it will eventually fail and we will go bankrupt. And since then, we've had five central banks, and just about every one of them failed, including the one we have now, which is called the Federal Reserve. Uh, 1913, they were formed by private citizens and private banks, mostly Europeans. And, uh, Congress turned over the monetary system to the Federal Reserve, which is three years later uh, came up with the income tax system, which uh, – uh, before that, uh, the government would not tax salaries or uh, wages of the individual, and that gave them the power to do whatever they want with taxes. They gave themselves the power. Of course, uh, the legality of the state compliance is still uh, it's, it's still under investigation as to the states uh, actually. Uh, confirmed it or not, most of them Well, Michael Ferris, I want to let you jump in. The concern yeah. there from the caller uh, seeming to be that Congress is giving up too much of its own power. 
Well, um, there would be two, you know, two issues. One is Congress grabbing more power and then giving up at the same time. Uh, the whole area of federal regulations is Congress thinks it's giving away its power to, like, to the Environmental Protection Agency to make rules. Uh, it's not giving away its power. The, it's the right of the people to elect the people who make the laws. And there's no ability to, to vote for the EPA. And so we think that, that Congress should have the political responsibility to make all the rules for this country. But on the, he's also right that Congress is continuing to, to grab power and, and gradually increase its power over time. And the, uh, a friend of mine said, what would the government look like if no president in history had ever vetoed anything? Well, you'd see Capitol Hill really run everything in the country. And he said, what would it be like if the U.S. Senate decided it was going to be like the House of Lords and, and approved 99% of the stuff that came from the House? Well, you'd see the House of Representatives really run the country. And then he said, what would it be like if the states never used their Article V power to re re check the power of the federal government, what you'd see is exactly what we have today, an absolute runaway federal power that continues to grab power. It has, it's so busy grabbing power, it has to disperse that out to agencies and others to make the rules for them. And so we need to see the states use their authority to check the power of the federal government to restrain it. And I think it's the uncertainty of how that Article V convention would work that has a lot of people concerned. Fizz Guy writes in on Twitter, any prospect of a constitutional convention would be overtaken by corporate interests and right-wing extremists, he said, is a bad idea. Can you address the, the, the corporate interests there? Well, it, it, you have to know how the, the delegates are appointed. They're appointed by state legislators. Uh, and so each state legislature appoints whatever number of delegates they want, but they, they vote in caucus. It's one state, one vote. And this process has been going on for a long time in a different uh, uh, component. The, we have the Uniform uh, Law Commission. The states all send delegates to the Uniform Law Commission where we got the Uniform Commercial Code and many other issues. They've been meeting together as states for over 100 years, and they propose uniform adoption laws, uniform laws on many, many subjects, and they, uh, it works very well. We know how the process works. It's been, that's been done to create statutory law. This would be done to create constitutional rules, but we have a well-worn, more than 100-year-old process, and it's just applying that same process to a different tactic. Let's go to Charlie Trenton, Florida, Line for Democrats. Charlie, you're on with Michael Ferris of the Convention of States Project. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I think that this uh, idea is kind of misdirected. Uh, it seems like anything that's passed by the states is always going to be uh, able to be trumped by the, uh, any federal laws. Look at, like, Second Amendment. If states try to control guns in the states, and it always gets overturned once you get to the federal level. So the federal government has to be big, it, and it has to apply evenly across all the states, any kind of laws, any kind of departments. It all has to be done federally so that the things with this being uh, done by the states just can't happen because not in this day and age it's too too fluid to have to be running evenly throughout the states the main amendment that needs to be done is have overturning citizens united because right now we're being controlled by a, a small group of people with a lot of money and they're electing their stooges to get in there and and screw up the laws screw up the government and and that's what's ruining this country we need to get back to where the people's vote counts for something, and it's not a choice between this rich guy's man and this other rich guy's man. We've got to get rid of Citizens United, and you've got to make sure that corporations are not uh, people, my friend. Got your point, Charlie. Go ahead. Well, I hope this guy likes his ATM card working effectively because it works because the states have adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, the the uh, It's not true that the federal government is the source of a lot of the laws that work, the, the, the banking laws of this country are controlled by state law. Now, the, the, there's the deposit insurance component of federal banking, but the basic laws of banking, why your checks are taken anyplace else, is because the states have created cooperative laws and work, can work together. And he misunderstands the nature of the process. We're creating a constitution here. Uh, this, this would be to create amendments to the constitution, specific revise the general welfare clause, revise the commerce clause, to limit both of those. They've been stretched way out of the original meaning, and the desire is to go back to the original meaning of both of those kind of clauses, just to give a couple of examples. And so the, uh, 
the states can, under Article 5 of the Constitution, which I would suggest that the, the caller uh, go read, uh, the states have the ability to unilaterally amend the Constitution of the United States by first proposing the convention on a particular topic, and then it will come back eventually to 38 states to ratify. So the states, uh, the ultimate law of the land, the ultimate, excuse me, the ultimate political power of the land is the power to lawfully change the Constitution by yourself. And the states, and only the states, possess that authority. Michael Ferris is with the Convention of States Project. If you want to check out more of his work, uh, it's conventionofstates.com and follow him at Twitter at COS Project. And he's with us for about the next 15 minutes or so. Leslie's up next, Burlington, North Carolina, line for Republicans. Leslie, good morning. Good morning. Michael, well, you already answered part of one of my questions, which was uh, what you thought of uh, Mark Levin's uh, The Liberty Project. Now, I have uh, an example, and I just want to ask you process questions. I'll give my example first, because I think that most people think that the federal government is the be-all and end-all of our, our system here. Well, what if every state, which they do all have an agricultural department, let's say every state had their own USDA, uh, North Carolina DA or something, and if our state isn't doing a good job, people across this country won't buy our meat, we wouldn't be able to export. This is just one example of these retarded federal agencies that uh, I think are a waste of uh, time because they're redundant. And they put another layer of rules and basically filling out forms for the federal government. But um, my process question is, okay, um, how is North Carolina doing on our ideas of getting this going? Because I can try to work on that if anyone in our state is actually interested. And then also, uh, we have the John Locke Society here, but um, and and also, you say 38 states need to ratify this, but do all 50 states have to send delegates to it? So in other words, we would have to get Connecticut, a holdout state, or Maryland that's right next to the federal government to be. Mr. Ferris. The um, North Carolina is has got the Convention of the States application in its legislature right now, so I, I encourage this scholar to uh, call her uh, state senator and her state representatives and encourage them to support a Convention of the States. I testified in uh, a committee in the North Carolina legislature about 10 days ago. And so it's, it's actively moving at this moment. Uh, the process is that uh, when 34 states apply for a convention for this same purpose, then the, every state, whether they voted for it or not, is entitled to send delegates to the convention and participate in the discussion uh, of the various amendments. And then you Entitled would, but not required? Not required. Uh, and so if they, they choose not to be there, that, that's their, their call. But it would be a simple majority vote of those who show up that would decide what the proposed amendments would be. I can't imagine a state not showing up. Is there any limit to the number of amendments that they could propose? Uh, no, no technical uh, limit. But the limits would just the, be the subject area that you're talking right. about. That's and, right. And there's the, there's the limit of political realism. Uh, I, I believe that political realism says something between four and seven amendments under our, our application will get through the process. And so there's not going to be 10 or 12. People will discuss a lot of different ideas and they need to be able to discuss a lot, a lot of different ideas, but it'll be distilled into a, a, a finite number of particular amendments that will be uh, on the nature of balanced budgets, tax limitations, spending limitations, and making sure that we have some kind of checks and balances on the judiciary. Let's go down to Charleston, South Carolina, on our line for independence. Randy is waiting. Good morning, Randy. Oh, yes, I'd like to ask the question. Uh, can't the uh, federal government put pressure on the states that uh, they don't want to go along with their uh, programs? I mean, like by holding funds that the state may need to use? Well, they can today, and that's one of the things I'd like to change because uh, the, uh, the people in South Carolina, the legislators in South Carolina, another state where this is pending right now, um, should be beholden only to the voters of South Carolina. And uh, if Congress tells the, the legislature of South Carolina what to do, then it's the voters of California and Illinois and New York and Alaska and Washington that are telling the legislators in South Carolina what to do. And if we're going to have a Republican form of government, every state legislature needs to be free to listen to only the voters in their own state. 
And so we're, we're violating that fundamental principle of self-government uh, in a very dramatic way on, on, on issues that no one ever consented to have Congress talk about. I mean, there's no consent in the Constitution, for example, on education, where I've spent most of my litigation career for homeschoolers. Um, Congress doesn't have any direct jurisdiction over education, and Congress should not be able to use the, uh, misuse the General Welfare Clause to dictate to the states by taking money from the, the people in the states and then telling their own state legislatures what they, what they have to do with this money. Two uh, more quick process questions sure. for you on how this would work. Would states, uh, would the representatives vote as individuals or would they s vote as state blocks? They would have to vote as state blocks. It would be just like the original Constitutional Convention where the states could send any number of delegates they wanted. Most states are considering five, seven, or nine delegates. And then they would, they would co effectively caucus on each issue. And so whoever cast the majority of votes for Virginia, let's say Virginia in seven, Four delegates from Virginia would cast the Virginia vote. And would the District of Columbia be represented or the territories? No. Bert's up next. Victoria, Kansas, line for Republicans. Bert, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chief Man, for having this important thing this morning. Uh, we need to point out that this is not a constitutional convention that would right. open the Constitution up to rewrite it. It's a convention of the states to amend the Constitution, and it would be the state legislatures doing it. The governors and our, leg and our uh, federal Congress would not have anything to do with it. And, they, and, and the people that don't want it to happen keep saying they're going to bring, you know, rewrite the Constitution. So we really need to point out that's not going to happen. Well, this is a uh, refreshingly well-informed caller. Thank you so much for doing your homework. Um, the, uh, only the legislatures have jurisdiction. Governors have no jurisdiction. Uh, Congress uh, can only do two things. One, they give the name, the time, and the place the convention is, is starts. Uh, so they'll say, you know, May 3rd, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, for example. Uh, and they, they get to designate the mode of ratification, either state legislatures or state ratification conventions. I, I would bet my eye teeth that they will choose state legislatures because ratification conventions are chosen directly by the people, and, and the people are going to be a lot harder on Congress than the, um, that a state legislature might be. And so um, in, in any event, it is not a constitutional convention. It is not open for anything. We've had 400 applications in the history of the country, but because we adhere to the single subject rule so strictly, we've never called a convention because you have to agree on the subject matter. And I actually litigated a case that gives you the second side of that rule. When the Equal Rights Amendment was, was proposed, it was originally given seven years for ratification. And Congress purported to change that by adding approximately three and a half years to the ratification period. And so the, uh, uh, I filed suit on behalf of uh, four Washington state legislators challenging the rule and the court, uh, the federal district court held, you can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. So we know you have to have an agreement on the subject matter to start. And it's already been held, you can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. Now that's, that's a persuasive but not binding precedent. But nonetheless, we didn't build that case out of thin air. There, there are other cases supporting that. And that's, that's really the rule. You, you have to follow the, the rules. This is a lot like international law. I have an LLM in public international law uh, from the University of London. And when sovereign entities negotiate with each other, there are certain rules. And, and the rules that we're talking about are consistent over time with how treaties are negotiated Anytime sovereign state governments are getting together, it's one state, one vote. You can't bind people without their consent and so on. It, it, it is very much a safe process and a known process. Let's go to George Spartanburg, South Carolina, line for independence. George, you're on with Michael Ferris. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. I uh, wanted to bring up a point here, a couple points, uh, and uh, get a response uh, from Mr. Ferris. Uh, first of all, he may made the comment that he couldn't imagine a state not sending somebody to the convention. Um, I taught constitutional law and government for a lot of years. I'm retired now. And uh, one thing that uh, I can't remember exactly the circumstances uh, in the Constitutional Convention uh, in 1787, but I do know that Rhode Island uh, did not allow uh, a convention to form in, in its own state in order to uh, ratify the Constitution. So, you know, the idea that maybe some states might 
uh, be recalcitrant and uh, decide they're not going to send somebody. I, I don't think it's a done deal. I think probably most states would send uh, delegates, but uh, you know, uh, based on what happened in the original convention, I don't think it's a uh, it's necessarily a done deal that every state will. The other point I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about, you're talking about the stipulations, the rules that uh, you have to stay within in order to uh, 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 have a convention. Uh, if I recall correctly, I believe there was a move back in the 80s or 90s for a balanced budget right. amendment, uh, and there was a move by, I think, 32 states had signed on uh, to have a convention, and I believe at that time, there was fear that, uh, you know, this was an unknown territory that was being charted here. And so uh, the, what I want you to respond to is if, uh, if uh, uh, you know, if this is really something that's uh, etched in stone, that uh, it has to be uh, for a specific subject matter, because I remember that there was great fear with that amendment that if it got to 34 states, uh, that proposed uh, constitutional convention uh, that uh, they could meet and start uh, uh, deciding to uh, mess with other parts of the Constitution. So, gotcha, those... George. Got your question. Michael Ferris, go ahead. Well, let's do the uh, fear question first. Uh, um, it, it's true that, that there's a lot of fear mongering about this question. Uh, 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 the John Birch Society is the biggest source of that fear mongering. Uh, ironically, uh, the John Birch Society's founder, Robert Welch, in the August 1963 newsletter of the John Birch Society, advocated a convention of the states for uh, an amendment that would repeal the 16th Amendment's income tax and uh, a few other things that that amendment would do. The second president of the John Birch Society, Larry McDonald, who is a Democrat member of Congress from Georgia, uh, he stood on the floor uh, of Congress right there and, and advocated for a convention of the states for that same purpose. And so the, the fear-mongering is from the newer leadership of the John Birch Society, and it's, it's just ironic that, that, that this, this small, very extreme organization is allowed to, to uh, foist its fear, its newfound fear, off on the rest of society. Uh, there is no basis for believing that. There, there, and the fail-safe is this. 38 states have to ratify. The idea that we could get something crazy through the system where 38 states have to ratify is, is simply uh, not, not well taken. And frankly, I can't remember his first question. Well, I've got one more question for you in the okay. minute or two okay. we have left. I want you to respond uh, to the end of Barton Hinkle's piece in his column uh, in Reason magazine. He's also a columnist for the Richmond yeah. Times-Dispatch right. in Virginia, where you live. He says, the biggest reason to be skeptical about a, about a convention of the states is this. It fails to address the very problem that inspired it. Advocates of a constitutional convention are upset that the federal government has grown too large. It has done so, they correctly believe, because politicians have ignored the plain meaning of the current Constitution. Yet if this is the case, then rewriting the Constitution with more or plainer language solves nothing. If politicians can ignore the language of one Constitution, then why can't they ignore the language of another? Two answers. One is if you, if you fix the judiciary and have checks and balances on the judiciary, that answers about 80 percent of his question. But the other thing is you can reverse the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court precedent lies at the heart of our, our efforts here. The Supreme Court said you can't be, a, black people can't be a person in Dred Scott. That got reversed in the 13th and 14th Amendment and it stayed reversed. They said that women, despite the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, women couldn't vote. That got reversed in the 19th Amendment and, and it stayed reversed. Uh, the Supreme Court in uh, the uh, Employment Division versus Smith said religious freedom is a second class right and Congress reversed that in the, in, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that I helped to write and it stayed reversed, and even the Justice, Justice Scalia that wrote the majority opinion in Smith voted for Hobby Lobby, voted against his own issue. And so you can reverse the Supreme Court. We can effectively go back to the Constitution as written by reversing Supreme Court precedent and tying their hands. If you know what you're doing and can write the law correctly, you can get them to follow the law. Michael Ferris is with the Convention of States Project. It's conventionofstates.com. We appreciate your time on a Saturday morning. Thank you very much.